We have abandoned generations of old practices in three things. One is your vote and account. Vote and account earlier, passing the budget sometime in May, June, led to the compression of the shelf life of budget announcements. And uh, in fact, a full year effect could not be given to whatever we wanted to do. That has been abandoned. The second thing is we have departed from the colonial legacy of a separate railway budget. This is also a very major decision because uh, the emphasis on a railway budget and the consequent political polarization about where the new lines have to be given, uh, what amenities have to be given, which sectors. This had led to a distortion in the overall transportation sector. Today, we have reached a stage when even the Air India is able to compete with the Rajdhani fares of railways. We had neglected coastal shipping earlier, and we were hauling coal all the way from northeastern coal fields to south, southern states with a wagon uh, insufficiency. All these things, I mean, I, I think this was all the resultant of a colonial legacy of having a separate railway budget. So we have abandoned that. And then a very important thing, this morning also I think somebody was referring to the plan and non-plan thing. We, when the cat itself was gone, why should the green remain? Planning commission has been taken away. And a more, and a more realistic thing of having a bifurcation between a capital budget and, 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 and a capital uh, budget and the uh, revenue budget. So I think we are moving in the right direction in the entire process of budget making. Now, the address of the Honorable President of India on 31st January, economic survey also on 31st January, and the budget of the 1st February are a continuum of an integrated approach to transformative governance. The Honorable President's address was an encapsulation of the nation's strengths, aspirations, potential, and the enumeration of efforts towards transforming India. Well, Sapki Chinta Sapka Vikas is a guiding principle of our governance. The emphasis of our concerns, both in the budget speech and as well as the president's speech, were towards what was very clearly enumerated in the Honorable President's speech. The Garib, the Dalit, the Pedit, Soshit, Vanchit, Kisan, Shramik, Yuva, and Mahila. The vision underlying our concerns is that of a rededication to the concept of Antyodhya as a fitting tribute to the revered Dean Dayalji whose birth centenary we are commemorating this year. <coughs> well, the Honorable President's address covered the path we have traversed in the last two years. The budget is the detailed agenda for the year ahead. We are not aiming merely at reforms. We look up to transformation. In the absence of which, the curse of poverty cannot be wished away. The ground reality <coughs> of a parallel economy 
depriving the state of its legitimate revenues compelled us <coughs> to demonetize. Once the birth banks of demonetization bear away, we will see the dawn of a resurgent India when the state will be equipped to resume the role of what is known as Ang Ankhaka Rishta. When there is an irritation in the eye, the arm, the arm does not wait for your command. It automatically rushes to the rescue the eye from the irritant. So, with, with the demolition of a parallel economy, with the additional resources which come through tax complaints, the state can instinctively rush to promote the welfare of the disadvantaged. And this is what we are doing. Since this government assumed power, it has been consistently striving for empowering the disadvantaged for reaping the benefits of an inclusive socio-economic order. We accepted the challenge of the ground reality of what an earlier Prime Minister said about only 17 paise reaching the target individual out of every rupee spent by the state. We took on the mantle of a, almost like a drain inspector unclogging the arteries of financial inclusion through the JAM Trinity, Jandan, Aadhaar, and the mobile phone. Digital India was perceived not as a luxury, but as a dire necessity to help the transformation of an informal sector, dominant, informal sector dominant society with an aversion to tax compliance into a formal economy adapting willingly to higher order of tax compliance. The transfer was facilitated by the phenomenal spurt in 26 crore dan, jan dan accounts, <coughs> along with 20 crore plus rupee debit cards. These are historic transformational steps which unclogged the arteries of financial inclusion. It facilitated the direct transfer of benefits to the targeted individual without the transit losses of leakages. 84 government schemes have already been boarded on the DBT platform. Once the targeted individual gets empowered through this JAM Trinity, he can easily be educated to propel towards a cashless or less cash transaction economy. One big advantage of the Jandan accounts is that large sections of the non-bank sector can now resort to bank credit. That itself will change the whole tenor of the banking system from one meant exclusively for the rich to one meant to more for the poor. Along with this unclogging to facilitate direct benefit transfers, our government have also mobilized Jan Shakti through programs as such as Ujwala and Ujala. Ujwala really teaches, uh, touches my emotional cords when I get reminded of my childhood days, which happened to be pre-LPG, pre-kerosene stove days. My mother used to make, twice a year, very religiously, she used to make single double burner clay chulas. And I used to assist her in the procuring of the casuarina wood for lighting the stoves with plenty of smoke. To, to know now that yeah. we are enabling all the housewives to move from a smoky chimneys to smokeless LPG is a very big relief. The budget elicits a twin attack in poverty. One of a direct attack through the transformation I refer to, 
on the second on the infrastructure for fighting property As, uh, fighting poverty sorry uh, not but focused menriga through drought proofing with a massive out outlay 48000 crores pradhan mantri gram sadak yojana with 27000 crores pm gramin avas yojana with 23000 crores din dayal gram jyoti yojana yojana 4814 crores it is worth highlighting that the outlay for rural agriculture allied sectors is a phenomenal 1.87 lakh crores 24 24% higher than the last year 26 27 uh, 26 uh, 17 some strange suggestion i would like to give for the attention of the honorable finance minister in para 44 of his budget speech he has referred to the paucity of human resources in panchayat raj institutions and has hinted at the launch of a program for human resources reform in this sector in a private members resolution pending for the last 4 years tabled by me i have suggested a workable solution for this without any additional outlay <coughs> This is based on a hands-on hands -on experience I gained by working as a chief executive for a panchayat union in Rajasthan way back in the early 60s. In there, the services of the tehsil are taluk-level government functionaries in departments like PWD, edu primary education, agriculture, animal husbandry, rural health. They were all placed on deputation. to the middle level in the three tier panchayat raj that is panchayat samitis in rajasthan and panchayat unions in many other states and set up answerable the, the manpower was deputed from the government departments to the panchayat raj institution and they were answerable and accountable to the elected panchayat raj along with the budgets and outlays of the field departments at the disposal of the panchayats this actually makes democratic decentralization a functional democratic decentralization mere uh, <coughs> you know mere placing some outlays on the hands of the panchayats without the manpower and without any particular accountability will not make them effective so this is the suggestion which i am giving in the context of what the fm mentioned in para para 44 of his budget speech one other major problem is of that of jobless growth we have an inherent triple advantage a world's largest democracy a demand generated by a 125 crore population and a demographic advantage of the world's largest youth power the demographic quotient should be harnessed carefully lest the advantage turns out to become a liability there is dire need for repositioning the education sector from its present matrix of the anglo indian uh, anglo saxon uh, uh, heritage to one that becomes skill oriented i again remember my primary school in days in the last years of british rule when even the alien masters understood the need for skill orientation i used to study in a district board school and we had regularly two hour classes every every second day for some skill training and i was in the carpentry section and learned a lot of carpentry In the post independence years of education policy unfortunately saw a reverse shift in two areas namely skill orientation and second moral education budget 2718 has earmarked 11640 crores for employment generation programs other than manrega which includes pm koshal vikas yojana atuf PM Mudra Yojana, PM EGP, and 
ASPARE. One suggestion for government's consideration. In addition, this morning also this was raised in a question uh, put to the skill development minister. The reference was to creation of a skill development university. Actually, we really do not want formal education for skill development. What is needed is that there is a job assurance after skilling. Today what happens is the person goes to the ITI, gets, yeah, gets some understanding in, in some skill, and then he is thrown on the job market. By the time he makes to the to, to, uh, proceeds to get employment, he has forgotten the skill. I think we should improve on the the uh, the, the uh, what do you call that? That uh, uh, probation. Uh, uh, people sort of being trained in areas which will all, all apprentice. apprentice sorry uh, the, actually we should upgrade the apprenticeship scheme and we, sh we should have a complete dovetailing with the corporate sector and the and the SME sector for training people for their required needs and and with the job assurance let us now turn to the fact, let me turn the focus on infrastructure. For a subcontinent like ours, inadequate physical infrastructure will at any time be a formidable challenge. The decision to do away with the railway budget, which I mentioned a little while back, is a bold initiative to look at the transport sector holistically and synergize the growth of roads railways, coastal shipping, and, uh, and aviation. A nation with a long tradition of savings, outstripping consumption, should not stagger in the pursuit of avenues of funding long gestation projects in infrastructure. The 3.96 lakh crore investment in 2017-18 generates high mm -hmm. hopes for early resolution of our infrastructure goes. At the time of presenting the budget, the finance minister expressed optimism about positioning of the GST in the very near future. With this historic legislation, we will usher in a transformed India on the premises of one nation, one common market. The annual economic review, which preceded the budget this year, has revealed that India is on par with China and USA with our internal trade of a magnitude 1.7 times of its international trade. This underlines the tremendous significance and impact of the single reform of GST. Mr. Deputy Chairman, I would like to conclude with a thought for more fo focused parliamentary oversight Annex 11, Annex 11B to Part A of the budget speech gives a list of 29 flagship schemes. In addition to our established system of departmental committees, we can perhaps structure schemes, scheme-wise committees of members of parliament to review and monitor some of the complex interministerial programs which will help in formulating meaningful budgets in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramakrishnaji. Thank you very much. Very meaningful suggestions to you.